pleasure to be here and thanks everyone for joining um and i hope you're ready to be more pirate or at least try and suspend uh, for the next 20 minutes or so everything you think you know about pirates and come and come along with me um the reason i wanted to frame this this storytelling session today on employee led movements is because i i honestly believe that it's it's possible to create change inside organizations from the ground up and yet i'm constantly hearing a wall on this topic um it's sort of common knowledge or or common wisdom that if you want to create culture change or transformation inside an organization it has to come top down everyone always says culture is created from the top um but i have seen enough evidence now to know that i think you can create a groundswell i think you can create a movement and i think when you do that it's often infinitely more powerful um and my approach i suppose to transformation at work is to tr- is to treat it like a social movement and that comes from pirates and so now i'm going to share my screen and take you um into the world of female pirates i imagine that some of you might be wondering what the hell does female pirate mean um well i am the captain director leader of be more pirate which i would describe as a social movement but it's a social movement that is mostly applied at work inside companies inside organizations it began life as a book by my co-pirate and colleague sam conniff he wrote this um back in 2018 um or published it in 2018 and it was really a, a venting of his frustrations about um the kind of vacuum of leadership that he saw um and the way that the system was systematically letting so many people down again and again and that we were so beholden to all these old rules about how we're supposed to work um that uh that you know the change that he'd been fighting for for a number of years working inside working with social enterprise just wasn't working and so be more pirate was a search for sam to find some some better role models for change and he stumbled upon, upon this metaphor of pirates um but then found that in fact it was not a metaphor at all because to be clear the book is a book about real pirates it's not a kind of business uh, metaphor like disrupt you know disruption i often hear piracy equated solely with disruption and what i want to share with you today is that it's about so much more than that it's actually really about culture of course we do grow up with this idea of pirates we tend to think of them as these cartoonish roguish villains from walt disney who are really only out for themselves and the truth of it is a lot more nuanced than that as history often is when you dig into it the truth is that um i would argue the golden age of piracy which is a tiny sliver of history from about 1695 to 1725 was actually the biggest workplace rebellion the world has ever seen and it probably looked a little bit more like this instead In the late 1600s there was a saying those who would go to sea for pleasure would go to hell as a pastime because being a sailor in the royal navy within the british empire and in navies around the western world was a brutal existence 40% of sailors would die on any voyage there was no guarantee of pay when you got back and pretty much you know people were were beaten on board um there was such a high death rate that they had to constantly over recruit which for me changes the view of why anyone would want to become a pirate really being a pirate was a kind of a bid for freedom they, they this this group of original pirates that arose um during the golden age of piracy were were challenging the establishment they were standing up to you know an uh, an elite that was completely self-serving and really out exploiting and plundering the world of resources and none of this was coming back into the pockets of ordinary people and i'd argue that a lot of that is still happening today. So this group of ordinary sailors decided that they were quite literally going to jump ship and go off and form their own crews. Which was an exciting decision but not necessarily an easy one either because you can imagine the scene you're suddenly out at sea with your new crew, um a group of probably illiterate um sword carrying men and you have no given leader, you have no rules of, about how you're meant to work together. um but you do have a blank slate you have a massive opportunity to completely change things um and operate in an, an entirely different way um in opposition to how they'd experienced things in the navy which is why the story is so interesting because pirates completely rewrote the rules the first thing that they did was to have 
real diversity and inclusion for the first time. Although my, uh, my screen is not going there. There we go. Um, we talk about diversity and inclusion um, like so much today. We have all these committees um, to figure it out, but the pirates are well ahead of this. This was the only place in the Western world at the time that you'd have seen people from all kinds of socioeconomic backgrounds coming together and working alongside each other as equals. There were female pirates. On the far right of the screen, we have Anne Bonny, who was like the most famous female pirate. Her story is so epic, I haven't got the time to go into it. Next to her is Black Caesar, who was originally an African tribal chief who was taken as a slave and then freed by pirate crews because they would quite regularly free um, slave ships in the sort of the latter part of the golden age of piracy. Um, and they were really a diverse bunch. Like we had this one-dimensional view of pirates, but they came from all kinds of um, backgrounds and stories and had fascinating um, tales to tell about why they wanted to be, what, what they were escaping and what, and what their reason for finding this freedom was. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that pirates then gave everybody on board a ship an equal vote. So it was really, really democratic and equitable. Everyone got an equal say in all the decision making that was made. It was only in battle that the captain would get the final say. So it was more democratic than ancient Greece. I just want to emphasize where only men had a vote. Um, this was was completely, completely one for one for all. The next thing they did was put, put proper checks and balances on power because um, nothing causes, uh, you know, they'd seen how how bad tyranny could get in the Navy. If you had a bad captain, um, you were really beholden to him and it created an, a miserable existence. So they created a dual governance system, which is what we see mirrored in Parliament today. They had a captain and a quartermaster, and a quartermaster was there to be the voice of the crew and to hold the captain to account. And the quartermaster would look after things like the punishment and the money, which are the things that are most likely to be abused by a bad leader. And these leadership roles could be voted in or out at any point in time, which is, I think, probably the most critical part, because we're so often come face to face with leaders that we can't get rid of, even if they're taking the, the organization in a really bad direction. Um, whereas leadership in, in uh, piracy was completely situational. It was like you were never a leader for life. You were a leader insofar as you were good at doing your job. They also had equal and transparent pay systems because nothing causes conflict like money. And really the first in, um, imperative of a pirate crew was to prevent mutiny, um, to stop the crew mutinying on, on, on themselves. So they made sure that everyone felt that they were treated equally, that they got their equal share of the treasure or the booty that they'd managed to accumulate. And um, typically the captain and the leadership roles would only get two to four times more than the crew members because you didn't you didn't see these big disparities in wages that we see again today where CEOs often get hundreds more than the average worker and it creates horrible inequality and um and probably a lot of simmering resentment they even had a social insurance system so if you lost a leg or a battle on a pirate crew you'd actually get compensation for your injury um which was really, again, a strategic move more than anything. I'm not going to claim that these were necessarily moral moves. I think they were just trying to operate in the best and most constructive way. But it probably also had the impact of feeling uh, people feeling that their lives were not expendable in the way that they were in the Navy. Um, but it also incentivized them to take part in the battle because they knew that they'd be protected properly. And finally, I think the most astonishing one is that pirates had same-sex marriage. They had a legal and ritual ceremony that was so sophisticated, there was an inheritance clause. So if your partner died, you'd get their share of whatever treasure you'd managed to get between you. The historians debate this a little bit. Um, some of those relationships were possibly just friendships, and it was a, a strategic way to protect your, your assets. But her homosexuality was also um, well documented in pirate communities. Um, so it was probably a bit of a mix of both. But nevertheless, I hope that that convinces you that pirates are not so much troublemakers, but actually innovators. And I think the, the thing I'd like to emphasize um, about pirates is that they um, their rebellion was a creative one. It was um, it was not um, a chaotic act. It was uh, a collect a, a collaboration. You know, they a, a pirate. I distinguish between a pirate and a rebel. A rebel is out there disrupting things regardless. A pirate um, only rebels as a cr inside a crew structure. So you can never do anything without sort of general consensus anyway. Um, 
And it was really more about making new rules than it was about breaking the existing rules. There's a definitely a need to break some of the existing status quo, but it was always about pr providing the alternative. And that's what I want to come to when we get into the mo modern piracy. All of these new rules were captured in the pirate code, um, which was the blueprint for their culture. This was a real document that um, articulated their, their rules, how they operated, what they stood for what it meant to be in a pirate crew and how, what you were supposed to be held accountable to. And this is what created really high levels of trust, I think, and accountability um, and, and allowed them to outgun the Navy. Pirates did um, a lot with very few resources and without um, yeah, the, te the technology that the Navy had. And the only way they could do that was if they were really, really tight as a crew. So I always emphasize this to teams, like forget you're creating more policies or top down um, rule, rule making. You need a code. You need a code that everybody is bought into, because the most important thing was that everyone decided on the rules in a pirate code. So it was voluntary. It was a form of governance, not government. And sometimes it's more about how you make the rules than what the rules actually are. So that's a little bit of the history. Um, Taking it back to today, um, that's what's captured in Be More Pirate. Um, and when it came out, uh, it turns out it created, uh, it, Sam managed to create a bit of a buzz around it. And in the eight months following the publication, he put out a job advert for a right-hand pirate, which is where I come into it because I replied to that job advert. It sounded quite interesting. But I was also in a place of being really, really disillusioned in my own life with um, with work. I'd been in an organization for seven years, facing all of the usual stuff, um, top-down management, a lot of micromanagement, um, a lot of uh, silos, um, KPIs that I didn't agree with. Um, I just didn't really think we were having impact. Um, so I kind of left feeling disillusioned, but not really knowing where, where to turn. And so this, this job advert popped up and it seemed really uh, intriguing. But I took all my frustration and my disillusionment right to Sam's doorstep when he invited me for an interview. And I quite literally asked him, you know, is your book more style over substance? I'm really sick of seeing leaders who won't put their money where their mouth is and don't walk the walk. Um, and uh, I was fully sort of prepared for him to say, you know, this is this is kind of a really great marketing campaign <laughs> more than anything else. And that he was just trying to grow a following. But actually, Sam turned out to be um, a very wonderful and inspiring human being and leader to me and mentor and he he turned around in that moment and just said to me I don't know what it is I don't know all I know is people have been writing to me from all over the world telling me that this book is is making them take action for the first time in a really long time they're finally finding the courage to kind of challenge things to go their own way and I'm overwhelmed with the response and I don't know what to do and I want to create it into something bigger if it helps people but I, I just don't know how and that felt like a, a great mission. <laughs> so I signed on the dotted line, came on board, and we've been doing this ever since. And it's been stormy and and not stormy at times. Um, but what I'd love to share now is, is what's come of that um, and what I've learned from really working closely with the people who've taken these pirate principles and tried to apply them and tried to create this, this idea of a groundswell, this um, employee-led mutiny um, and the, some of these stories are captured in a second book um, which I we, we published in in 20 um, which should come there published in 2020 but actually the question that I get asked more often than not is not how do you be pirate but how can you be a pirate in the navy because what was so interesting about all the people who came forward from the original book was that they were inside big organizations. They were inside big public sector places or, or big corporates. And they were just like, this is where the change is really needed. This is where the change could be transformational, but it's so hard. Um, so can we do this? Can we, can we apply these ideas if on the inside? And Sam originally thought that the book would be for entrepreneurs, I think, um, people who wanted to sort of, you know, start their own new thing. But this is where I think the most important change happens. Um, so now I'm going to share with you sort of my five, my five practical steps to being a pirate in the Navy, um, and creating a sort of employee led pirate movement. The first thing is really obvious, um, never attempt anything alone. And I put this in because I'm always surprised at how many people come to me and say, 
yeah, I tried this. I tried to be prior. I tried to challenge things. I went to my boss and I said this and this and nothing happened or they were ostracized or eventually they got so fed up they had to leave. And I said, do you know if anyone else feels the same as you about this issue, this, this, the problems that you're seeing inside your company? And they were like, well, yeah, probably. But I was like, well, have you made the effort to really talk to them and to, to build relationships with those people? And they mostly say no. <laughs> and this is so this is the, super, the most important first step. Find your allies, like really find them, though, not just like kind of know who they are, like build relationships with them. Talk to them one on one. Get down the cafe, down the end of the road. Um, talk about the the status quo and what you what you want to change. Be vulnerable. Build trust with each other. And this might take three months, six months, a year. It doesn't really matter because these people are critical. They're the people who keep you sane. They're the people who are a great sounding board. They're the people who will challenge you if you're going too far. Um, you can't do this alone. We all know that five to eight people is a magic number for like small groups change the world. So in trying to form a movement it always starts from these small clusters i find and this has been the case across every pirate workshop i've done every team that i've worked with um finding finding those allies first and i want to share with you quick one quick example on this um i've been facilitating a, a pirate crew inside our national health service in the uk um obviously not many of you i, I don't think are from the uk but it's a big thing here our healthcare service is very precious, but it's also on the verge of collapse a lot of the time. And it's huge. And it's got the most um, employees in, I think, in the whole country. And they really want to challenge things. There's a lot that needs to be changed and updated, but it's incredibly hard to do. It's very bureaucratic. It's very hierarchical. It's very like the Navy. So this group come together regularly to just start to talk, build those relationships, build that trust. And I think eventually we'll start to see more and more pockets of them working together to make changes. And they they um, created a code, which I just want to share with you quickly, because I think it's a nice um, set of principles that any team could use if they wanted to start to form a small crew. So their code is, number one, um, tell stories, um, share when successes and risks have paid off. I emphasize this because we are inspired to make change because of listening to each other. If you think someone else can do it, you're more likely to think you can do it. Number two is to um, use them as a sounding board. Ask for help for dilemmas and decisions. Number three is avoid the dilution of your aspirations. Like it's so easy in the day to day of work to be realistic all the time. Um, but you've got to keep the bigger vision, the bigger ambition in mind and having a group that shares that is is really helpful number four is to disclose mistakes and failures because um on the flip side of sharing success stories a few people came forward and said actually i quite like to hear the mistakes too because i want to feel more human in all of this like i i mess things up and i can't always tell my immediate team so um that felt important too and finally get a courage refill um just simply come being able to go to a place with other people that make you feel courageous is I think possibly the most important of all. So that's the first thing. The second thing is once you've got your crew together to start speaking up. Um, I think the biggest barrier to change is our inability to speak about the things that are really important. But it's not what you say, it's actually how you say it. This is the most important thing I've learned. When we try to speak up and challenge the status quo, most of the time we do it in the moments when we feel the most frustrated. Like we take the moment, the opportune moment in the meeting. And it often when we when we do it, all the emotion that we feel be, um, behind that sentiment comes out. So if we're really frustrated about a pay policy or sustainability policy, we're likely to, to bring that out in what we're saying. And all the other person is going to feel is that they're being attacked. And that doesn't get you anywhere. So actually, use your small crews to practice this. Practice how you want to raise difficult topics. Practice does two critical things. It will diffuse the emotion out of it because you'll get all the ranting and the venting that you need to do out in private and you'll build confidence. It's a myth to think that the first time that you say something, it's going to come out in the right way. Like we we need to, to put into practice, like we need to practice articulating what matters in a way that creates connection and not resistance. Um, so that's my second um, step. 
Number three is to turn your frustration into fuel. And this is really to just emphasize that no social movement or movement of any kind can be built on, on a set of complaints. Um, that drains everyone's energy. So even if you've identified what's really going wrong, you then need to flip it and be able to describe what good looks like um, in the way that all successful social movements have been able to say, we're actually fighting for freedom here. So yeah, turn what you're fighting for, uh, to fighting against into what you're fighting for. And in very practical terms, I would say, make sure you go into any meeting that you have about what's going wrong with a suggestion of what you, how you would do it differently. And, and, and what usually happens here is that you come up with your suggestion and then the leadership or whomever is a, you've got to get the tick box from says, oh, we don't, I'm not sure about that. There's X, X, Y risk to this because people are always afraid of change. Um, so the way I get around this usually is to, to say, just treat it as a pilot or an experiment. Be very, very clear that you're asking for permission, not for a permanent change, but for a one month or three months to try out a new idea and if it doesn't work or that it really does invoke some real risk, then you're happy to go back to the way it was. But if you've really thought through your idea, most of the time um, it will be successful and it'll stick. So putting it through as a, as a pilot usually gets you a little bit further. Number four is to be um, to fire a pistol, not a cannon, or what I would call um, take small, bold steps instead of um, shooting for the moon to begin with. That's not to say you should be you should diminish your, your overall ambition, but recognize that if when you're creating a movement, you have to, you have to create momentum, that like you have to draw people to your cause. And the easiest way to do that is to show that you are somebody who gets stuff done and you can achieve something that will please a lot of people. So this might be like a really small change. And I'm going to give you an example in a minute. Um, something that is quite logistically easy for you to achieve in a short space of time that can kind of show, OK, We've made a small step on the road to a better X, Y, Z. So if you're talking, if your overall concern is, say, diversity, what's the easy thing that you could do that shows that you're, you're, taking, you're taking action quickly? There was one crew um, that did this quite effectively in, a, in an organisation, a, a big local government organisation here in the UK, which I talk about in the book. Um, and their, their overall ambition was to bring the soul back to work. So very in line, line with Teal. Um, but they were like, well, what can we at least initiate that's easy? Um, what small shred of that can we start to do? And they decided that they had that they wanted to tackle email culture because they felt that email was really very mishandled, very draining in the organization. So they created a set of new rules around how to handle emails, which is these four bullet points here basically bringing a bit more humanity back to communication. But the key thing about this was that they put this as their email signature. So when you sent an email, you saw this. <laughs> so you're always reinforcing the message um, and, and bringing people on board and reminding them of what the change should be. And the final thing is to tell tall tales. And I refer back to the previous slide on this because what they were doing with that is to create a cultural currency. They were re creating a, a clear message and reinforcing it over and over. And pirates are really PR masters of their fate. Um, they were phenomenal storytellers. Um, and it was storytelling that often, the, the storytelling element that often um, enabled them to not get into battle. The Jolly Roger, the Skull and Crossbones, as we have here, is, is arguably the world's most enduring brand ever. And they used it strategically to... Um, to kind of make enemies afraid of them so that they, as soon as they saw the, the black flag, they would immediately surrender. And this meant the pirates didn't have to get, to get into battle very often. So they were very, very good at using their reputation and their storytelling. And I think this is just a really, really underutilized thing um, in terms of how we think about change within organizations. It's something that every social movement knows that they have to have. You have to have a strong hook. You have to create some kind of currency or some kind of symbolism around um, the change that you're trying to make. And what I often see in when we do be more pirate is that people just make sure that the the kind of the small changes, the small small bold actions that they're making, have a kind of catchy phrase or a catchy title that just helps it stick. And then people start to associate 
um, it with that more easily. You know, so a lot of people use Be More Pirate as a as a way to kind of create the movement. Um, but I, I feel like it's underestimated because I think that in in a lot of teams, smart people will default to information first rather than defaulting to emotion. And it's emotion that makes us us create change. We have to feel something first. Um, so always thinking about the story that you're telling, even if it's a story of failure, this is what will draw people to the cause. And I will leave it there. I think I've probably gone over time, um, possibly not. Um, so that's my five steps to creating an employee, employee movement. Let's... Um, move into having a conversation i'd love to i couldn't see the chat so i'd love to see if anyone had any thoughts or comments or questions <laughs> cool Let's have a look. Okay, I've lost my rebellious way a bit. You'll focus me again. <laughs> well, you're very welcome. I hope so. Um, yes, I think it is very individual as well. Um, I would definitely, uh, in a way, like I've given you some steps, but I think that it's um, it is not a, it's not a magic for there is no magic formula. There's never a silver, silver bullet to these things. I think that quite often we're given frameworks that attempt to convince us that there is a, a kind of step-by-step -step process, but actually what we say in Be More Pirate often is na forget the map and navigate with a compass instead, which is a ni nice piratey metaphor for sort of saying, um, you use sort of your internal navigation system a bit more. So in an, in a, complex and uncertain landscape which is arguably what the world and the world of work feels like right now it's much like rather than relying upon you know the five-year strategy that's been built by your company or relying even on like a set of preordained milestones that you have to hit navigating a little bit more by knowing your strengths and your weaknesses and um tapping more into your motivations and your and your desires and kind of ebbing away from the things that drain you and what that looks and feels like as a way of navigating through a difficult period of time. Um, just trying to read some of these. Um, Alex, there was a question early on in your presentation, though you might have covered it already, that was the pirate community all adhering to these, the, to the same standards and how are they sharing information? And then I think you talked about the pirate code, but I don't know if there's anything more you would add over there. Hmm. Um, so what's interesting is it is called the, the pirate code because all the pirate codes are pretty much the same. They were all of those, those particular rules that I went through with often a few kind of additions on the end. And it was because, um, the pirate community was very, very well networked. They all, in the end, they all kind of congregated on Nassau in the Bahamas. So, um, if you had goods to sell, you would go back to Nassau. And so everyone did sort of know each other and quite often pirates would collaborate and fight battles against the Navy together. So word got around and, and that's how everyone knew, oh, we've got equal say over there, we want it here. And hence the pirate code became quite monolithic in the end. But there are, when you look through some of the historical codes, sometimes they'll have a random rule on the end, like um, the band only play, the band will play on Sundays. They have like a band in some of the crews. <laughs> or there was one that actually had a an article that prohibited rape, which I thought was quite uh incredible but probably there was an incident like quite often they'd create the rules in response to what was actually happening so if there was a an issue that arose they'd create a new article to to address it was that what consensus based also yeah oh rules. so the pirate, the pirate code even as far as i'm aware from what i've read of the history there's a really good book called the invisible hook um which is by a, an economist called peter leeson um, he gets into the, like the economics of pirate society in a much more depth than Be More Pirate does. But he he points out that um, even if one article in a code was voted against, they wouldn't include it because it was too risky. They really didn't want to like um, uh, give it give any potential to having a mutiny on board. It was just to to make sure that everyone was was happy. I would imagine that most people just were kind of willing to go along with the general um consensus um 
And of course, those those kind of core rules I went through were were, were seen pretty much everywhere. Um, yeah. Okay, so then another question: When you refer to a movement, does this mean a change that reaches a tipping point and becomes irresistible, or not necessarily? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a good question. What what does a movement actually look like? Um, I think that movements can look different in different places. Oh, God, I mean, lots of people say we've created a movement and, you know, one could argue they haven't really. Um, I think a movement is visible to people, um, uh, like in, you know, in, in an environment. So um, I, it, what the question was, is there a tipping point for it? Um, Should it be a tipping point? Is that how you define a movement? That it gets to a place where it's irresistible, or is there many ways in which you describe a movement? Perhaps that's that's a yeah. So it's a really good question. Um, I think it, I think well, movements will be irresistible to some to certain people for sure. Um, a movement doesn't have to reach everyone. Um, I think the the purpose being clear about the purpose of your movement to begin with is is like one of the core components so that's why i say at the beginning when you're forming the small crew with a view to creating like moving a mutiny into a into a movement i'd say is um when you um you have a very clear like idea of what is it that we're trying to make a change on here but then there will be inevitably be kind of steps before that so you might be like like i said your overall change might might be this company needs to become more diverse like that's the big thing here. But what does that concretely mean in terms of um, actionable things that you're going to do? So it might be we need to change our recruitment policy. It might be um, we need to make sure X amount of leaders are from different backgrounds or something like that. Um, and I think all of those are small wins. And I think all of those would, would equate to being a movement. I don't think you have to have, a, in a way, movements... Um, almost never achieve like a utopia anyway. So it, you know, I think having a critical mass of people involved in some way is definitely a way to describe it as a movement. And I would say for me, a movement is also something that is fluid. It's not something that is ever going to be sort of formalized into like an organization or an association in the same way. Um, but that's, I suppose my definition, because I think there are characteristics of the way that a movement works that that is necessarily needs a, a level of, of freedom within it. Um, yeah. There's yeah. a question on: Are there environments where this approach would be more difficult, or is there no limits to where you could use <laughs> it? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm seeing I'm seeing other questions in the chat which I want to answer. But uh, to that one, oh god, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, it's difficult. It's much more difficult in certain places than others. Every culture is different, right? So um, I don't think that the the places that I work in um, on this stuff are easy. Like it's not easy. When I say you know I work with the healthcare workers, it's not easy to to be creating a movement there. Um, it happens in pockets, um, connections swell and then die um and so yeah we're constantly working out how it is that you keep it together and i think just going to address the comment in the chat about um when people get enthusiastic to begin with and, and it fizzles out um yeah my steps are to help you sustain it like the idea of like trying to create regular momentum is so important but being really honest about what momentum is and looks like like i think you know sometimes we try to create movements through um uh quite conventional means like hosting a you know a zoom meeting every month isn't necessarily going to excite anyone um you have to really tap into what people's motivations are here and what would make them like really feel a lot better and what why this would feel worth investing their quite precious time in um so that's why i think starting in these really small one-to-one -one relationships is so important because you have this core group that you know are going to hold it together and have each other's back um, and you, you've done a bit of gr the groundwork uh, around like what it is the change should be and what, what you want to, and, and what's some actionable steps there. Um, yeah, well, there's so many, I'm just reading all these comments, but I don't want to take away from the Mentimeter questions, uh, Ratna. 
Yes, I just put one in there from Mentimeter, which is what's the difference between asking what would a parrot do and asking what would Jesus do? <laughs> yeah, well, I don't know if I know enough about Jesus. <laughs> so, I think they um, meant that that question tends to be a good, like thinking out of the box prompt. Um, so maybe, you know, being more pirate is already an attempting to think out of the box, something like that. Um, yeah, so I would say, um, actually, maybe they're almost entirely opposite, because I would say, you know, ultimately, Jesus is intended to be somebody who has achieved some kind of enlightenment and, and really understands, like, the purpose of why we're all here and, and you know, as a, as a direct line to God and all of this, you know, <laughs> whereas I'd say um, being pirate is, like, very human. It's very, it's very much the anti-hero role. It's, like, kind of accepting you know, that you're not going to get things right, that you've got to kind of try things out. You're going to have to be in the unknown a lot of the time. Um, I think that's a really cool point, like trying to become a bit more comfortable with uncertainty and uncomfortability in the process of, of change. Um, so I think, yeah, an empire would would be willing to venture into the unknown territory with courage, but not necessarily a plan <laughs> sometimes, and and kind of explore and, and figure it out as you go. Um Whereas I, in my mind, I suppose asking what Jesus would do would, would comes with a degree of sort of certainty, um, but perhaps I don't know enough. Yeah, Jesus was a pirate. Well, he's definitely like he 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 stood up and was willing to be different to everyone else. So I suppose in a way, yeah, um, yeah. Never answered that question before. <laughs> <laughs> James, I saw you had two questions. Um, Perhaps he could help us exp if you if you're comfortable coming off mute. Like, when you say, "How would a folk be different from a movement?" Maybe you'd have to help us understand what a folk is. And you also yeah. said, "Can we be the Nassau for Cruz? Who is Nassau?" Okay, a little bit of context. Uh, hi, Alex. Hi, everyone. Hi. hi. So uh, I have a business on the South Bank called Limin. L I M I N. It's a Caribbean bar restaurant. Mm -hmm. uh, Limin is Canadian for playing. I'm not sure so whether you're so familiar. So are you again. familiar with are you familiar with the social practice in Trinidad of liming to lime? No. Okay. Um, well, to lime is is actually uh, how Trinidadians express their freedom, their cultural identity, and uh, Trinidad is a culture based in play, in direct opposition to Western culture, which is based in work. So Trinidadians look out for fun. They look out to play. They go out every day looking for opportunities to lime, L-I-M-E. The verb is to lime. So we've named our business Limein, L-I-M-I-N. Ooh. No, I should know so, that because my, yeah. Sorry, carry on. So we, my offer to you is that we could uh, create uh, our own very Nassau for your pirate cruise at Limein on the South Bank. Yeah, I mean, I feel like I have to understand it a bit better, but yeah, definitely. Um, that sounds really exciting. I should know this because one of my best friends is Trinidadian. <laughs> Ask them what it means to lime. The interesting thing is that Trinidadians don't really, they don't really, when you ask them that question, they'll be a little bit bewildered because it's just something they grow up with doing naturally. But uh, Trinidadians, and anyone actually, it's not, 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 not restricted to Trinidadians. It's, a, it's actually a gift to the world, as I see it. Uh, anyone can lime anywhere, anytime, with anyone. It's more about the spirit in which you engage with others, and it's a playful spirit. Mm. It's fun. And so Trinidadians can uh, go for a beach line, for example, which is a bit more organized and, 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 and predicted, although you never quite know what the outcome might be, and this is the beauty of it. It's, it's often time-bound. And you're in the moment when you are liming, and often a lime reaches a point of uh, of such energy and intensity that you move from the ordinary to the extraordinary. Mm. So you sort of come out of your. So it's actually a really beautiful practice, uh, which we have called our business. Uh, my partner is Trinidadian. That's why um, we we're in business together. That's why we've called it liming. L i m i n. But interestingly, lime in uh, also Latin for a threshold. Oh, okay. Yeah. Liminal. I like that. <laughs> liminal, and it's yeah. the word liminal. liminal. 
is derived. Are you familiar with liminal spaces? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, well, we just call it going going beyond the edges of the map, but it's basically the same. <laughs> it's very much a journey, that's sure. Uh, and actually, it's the transition between two places or two states, emotional states. Mm -hmm. And that journey can be a little uncomfortable at first because you move from the familiar to the unfamiliar. Mm -hmm. In that space, there is possibility for transformation because you come out of yourself. Yeah. You experiment yeah. with different identities or you become aware of, of yourself in different ways. That sounds so that's very cute cool too. Um, James, I'm going to move to the next question, but I'd love if you could put some links in the chat about liming or in your business. Sure. I, I can actually um, send you, if you'd be interested, an academic paper on liming. Uh, uh, an American academic studied this phenomenon, and it's, it's a really beautiful read. It's a really beautiful read. I believe you can link to, to papers or even upload a document on the Zoom chat, so you could do that. Okay, um, I'll do that. Thank you. Try that. And our next question is, um, Alex, how can we prevent mutiny among our crews? And yeah. Hmm. Um, yeah, how can, we, how can you prevent mutiny? Well, I don't think it's, it's anything super complicated. Um, making sure you're taking the crew's views into account. Um, like I think the heart of Be More Pirate is this equitable decision making and kind of more consensus based way of working, um, and situational leadership where you allow people. I mean, I think what I love about pirates is that you they're kind of honoured the collective and the individual at once. Like it, no one was expected to to kind of um, submit all of their individuality or their their power to to the group. But you know those those opportunities to realise your own skills and and be the leader if you were good, but then you were never allowed to dominate. Um, so I think just things like really listening to your um, to your teams um, and being a bit more human about work. Like this probably comes through in all of the teal discussions. The things I hear the most frequent are just like everyone's everyone's uh, just frustrated with things that are not necessarily the fault of people in leadership or management positions, but are just legacies of the way we think work should be. Um, the historical precedents that just need overturning, but we're all trapped in the mindset and the conditioning that we've all experienced for so many years about how, how it should be. And we don't challenge a lot of these kind of day-to-day -day things. And over time that builds and people become frustrated and they they kind of want to, they want to mutiny. So I think there's, there's two layers. There's the, the stuff that's very like, that drains people a lot that's process and and just the the structure of of work and things and then there's leadership behaviors and um I, when i was doing the the nhs crew last week there um we were talking about power dynamics and deconstructing power and the core of it was that we we keep on creating managers and we don't create leaders and the definition of leadership is fundamentally different today and, but there's not that much um, training or, um, or systematic training, good training, I think, in organizations. I mean, this, I feel like this group here is probably quite, you know, it's a unique group of people who, um, around the world, who understand Teal and understand lots of the new ways of working. But generally speaking, when I'm going into organizations, it's still very, very command and control, very, um, kind of yeah leadership is a status still very hierarchical um and people really suffer under that so um yeah i think looking at leadership behaviors um and and ch challenging all these like little day-to-day -day things um will prevent your your team from mutinying and kind of rehumanizing work as much as you possibly can I think people also, I notice this a lot when I'm doing rewriting the rules. It, it doesn't sometimes matter if you don't fix all the problems at once, but if people feel heard, they're much more likely to stick with it. Cool. Should we, pre should we prevent mutiny? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Um, just saw that one in the chat. Like, um, I think again, like, 
ultimately you shouldn't suppress mutiny if you're in charge of a team of 10 people and they all think something should change <laughs> then you you know quite yeah i'd argue that you should go with the groundswell as a, instead of instead of trying to suppress it unless you can provide incredibly good reasons as to why it shouldn't happen and so much of why we resist change is simply fear and i think the practice of being pirate and putting and doing these small bold actions as well that's something i'd emphasize that when you're creating the the small actions within your movement or your mutiny even if they don't achieve anything um in the short term actually it changes you um because you become less risk averse you re realize that actually if you try and do a few small things like nothing like crazy is going to happen and it emboldens people and that is something that um i noticed this with social being involved in social movements even if you know you did you tried something last year and it didn't work that person goes on to do something incredible two years down the line and, and lead something and yeah it's so the purpose is more important than who is on the bridge yeah just going to scan and see if there's any other questions in the chat there are no more than many people so alex i know you also said sometimes you ask questions of the audience and we have Five minutes more, so the floor is yours in terms of how you want to guide it. Yeah, I, I mean, I'd love to ask questions um, of the audience. If you know the, the core question I usually ask is, "What rules do you think need breaking?" The follow up to that is, "What's getting in your way?" So, what is actually stopping you from from breaking the rules? Um, and that's usually a yeah a combination of a couple of things um and then the the third question is what would your new rules be if you were able to remove the barriers what would you create instead um so if anyone has any thoughts or comments on anything they're working on i'd really be interested or answers to those Safer. Something I've been thinking about is there is this rule about some information is is privy or relevant or safer only for a few people to have, while and it's it's so often kept secret. And that could be formal or informal kind of rule, but often it's a very social rule that the first first reaction to to difficult information or potentially controversial information is like oh oh like keep it quiet um and i'm wondering i guess the question is what would what would what would it be like if every everybody had access to all information like how would we behave and act accordingly but people well, we do have a lot of access to information Yes, I guess within organizations or or within groups of um, places, there's a hierarchy on who can or can't access certain information. Yeah, I don't think that's that's the thing. Um, if I'm honest, I think mm -hmm. access to information is not the problem. Um, the problem is fear. If if anything, um, that's the barrier that keeps us all from doing this. So everything that you can do to to start to build that I, I genuinely think that change inside in the world in general and and inside organizations as a as a conduit for bigger transformation comes down to courage and imagination um so the more you can cultivate those two things in different ways the stronger you're gonna be and the stronger you can make a team um so and and what happens is that inside our, our our companies um very little practices or training um directs us towards those two things we're not given opportunities or ideas to put courage and imagination into practice and think of them as a muscle to exercise regularly um and I, when i i kind of i mean really mean imagination because imagination is something that's hard to access i think it's hard to access when you're bogged down by day-to-day -day stuff you need like free like movement and you need 
um, to be in different spaces and places and stimulated often to get your imagination going. And that doesn't happen um, as regularly as it, as it could do. And obviously I'm, I'm generalizing here. Um, I know that probably people here work in quite progressive spaces in, in some ways, but um, yeah, like I think the biggest thing that came from me working with Sam to begin with was that he allowed me to do so much more than I'd ever been ever been given permission to do inside a company because they're so risk averse to, you know, you might damage the company reputation or you might, um, I don't know, <laughs> make a mistake. Sam didn't mind me making mistakes on his behalf. And that was astonishing because I'd never experienced that, that kind of leadership before. He didn't care if like I got it wrong. But what he did in doing that was so much bigger because I believed in myself so much more. He invested almost silently in my potential and that has actually paid off, I think. So <laughs> I hope he feels it's paid off because I was able to go so much further with this movement and be more pirate than I would have done had he kept me small. So that was super important. Yeah. With a minute to spare, um, maybe I will, will bring us to a close. That's, that's um Courage and imagination seems like a beautiful place to, to leave and reflect on. Um, any last thoughts, Alex? <laughs> um, well, if you'd like to keep in touch or connect to more about Being More Pirate, then please um, connect with me. Um, I'll put my email in the chat. Um, we're on social media um, and that by all means, buy the book. <laughs> um, I should plug my book. I never plug my book. Um, if you buy it from my website, you'll get it all wrapped and sealed with a wax stamp, a pirate style. Um, but also I have a meetup group, which you can access via the website, which um, if you ever want to come to an informal pirate meetup, I host them usually about once a month, just online. People drop in. We talk about all of the stuff I've just said about how it, how to create change. And um, you just meet some, some random pirate fans. Um, and uh, yeah, in future there'll be there'll be other things. And I run workshops on Be More Pirate. So that's my that's my final plug. Um, but thank you all for joining tonight. Thank you.